An ancient species of fish is endangered in the Chesapeake Bay area. Can we save the Atlantic sturgeon from extinction without polluting its gene pool? The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. It's a perfect April day in Virginia. And on the James River, biologist Greg Garman and PhD student Matt Palacic head out to a spot where three months previously, a hundred piles of rock were dumped in the river. Their mission, to save the Atlantic sturgeon from dying out in the Chesapeake Bay. This bone-plated throwback can live up to 60 years, weigh as much as 900 pounds and reach over 10 feet in length. Sturgeon are the Atlantic's biggest and oldest anadromous fish, mostly living out at sea, but returning to their home rivers to spawn. But after hundreds of thousands of successful years, along came modern man, urbanization, and mechanized fishing. And by, uh, by about the 1990s or so, it was generally thought that the population of Atlantic sturgeon in the James River was extirpated. That is, there were no longer any any fish except maybe a few strays from other systems. The commercial fishermen uh, said that wasn't true, that they regularly caught fish. In fact, as far as we know, the James River has the last viable uh, population of the species in all of Chesapeake Bay. Conservationists and biologists wanted to restore the fish to sustainable levels. The more scientists learn about genetic diversity and its role in an ecosystem, the more cautious they are about tinkering with the gene pool. So they ruled out stocking the James with fish from the larger populations in the St. Lawrence or the Hudson Rivers. Folks are beginning to understand the importance of population genetics as opposed to just population biology to these kinds of restoration efforts. Research has shown that there are distinct populations of sturgeon native to each of the five main estuarine systems along the East Coast. They, these fish have a very unique or a very uh, elaborate migration period as when they go out to the ocean, they're going to mix with all other populations and all that. But when they spawn, they come back to their natal rivers at a, a high percentage of the time. It's called site fidelity. So even though they're mixing all out in the Chesapeake Bay, even in maybe the lower James River or all the way up in the Bay of Fundy. Those fish will likely just come back to this area in the James River to spawn, so their distinct genetic signature is still maintained. Two phenomena can permanently alter the genetic diversity of a vulnerable population. They are called the bottleneck and the founder effect. Genetic variation is randomly passed from one generation to the next. Each offspring gets a lottery pick of gene variants, or alleles, from each chromosome. In a large population, things even out, and a diverse gene pool is maintained. But when a population is suddenly reduced in size, say from a century of overfishing, there's a bottleneck. The remaining adults are only going to transmit the available fraction of the gene pool that they represent. If a gene doesn't get passed on from one generation to the next, it's gone forever, and diversity is lost. So there are still fish, um, they're still reproducing, but um, that inbreeding is potentially having negative effects on uh, disease resistance or survivability or growth rates, and uh, the, the population just basically uh, dies out over a relatively short period of time. As we begin to understand that it's, it's really important to consider um, the genetic structure of a population to try to rely more on natural reproduction and the native genes of an area. It has changed the way we go about doing restoration projects. Probably the, the obvious change is uh, we have to have a lot more patience. Historically, even just 10, 20 years ago, uh, restoration projects like this probably would have been based on hatchery propagation. The goal would have been to, been to get in there and raise numbers of individuals in an area as quickly as, as possible. When a new population is started by a relatively small number of individuals, say a bunch of fish from another river system, 
Only their genes are available to future generations. This is called the founder effect, and like the bottleneck, it leaves the new population with less diversity and open to problems caused by inbreeding. And those genes might not adapt the fish that result um, to conditions that are, are typical and normal here for here. And so the restoration would in fact, uh, would in fact fail. But for um, Atlantic sturgeon, um, in the James, everybody's made a, that's involved in the restoration project has made a conscious uh, decision um, to not introduce non-native genes into the James River. The James River team believe they are intervening just in time to save the native sturgeon from losing their unique genetic signature. So there is an appropriate amount of genetic diversity, uh, a good deal of genetic mixing, and the thing that is exciting to us that are trying to restore the sturgeon is we've got a lot to work with. Not necessarily a huge number of fish, and we do have a degraded habitat, but at least that James River population seems to be genetically viable and a good foundation on which to um, try to encourage restoration of the species. For sturgeon to reproduce, they need a rocky river bottom. They spawn in open water over rocks and the fertilized eggs sink to the bottom and stick to the rocks. But centuries of agriculture and construction have washed vast amounts of silt into the James and other rivers, altering the very nature of the riverbed. So that when that sturgeon egg, even if there is successful reproduction, that egg ends up dropping into silt and is smothered and, and dies. On a cold, clear day in February, a team of VCU scientists with government organizations and Lux Stone Corporation went out to a spot that research suggested would provide ideal spawning conditions. By dumping a hundred piles of crushed rock on the river bottom, they created an artificial reef for the sturgeon to spawn over. We're at a point just over there where two parts of the river channel come together, um, and so we have good strong currents every time the tide changes. And of course what that does is it helps to sweep any accumulated silt and sediment off the reef. They also needed to make sure the proposed site was within commuting distance for the fish. Scientists at VCU had been radio tagging sturgeon since they reappeared in 2005. This map here is of three fish, adult fish, that we tracked in 2008. This is where the spawning reef is right in this location here and you can see that the fish did spend some time in the immediate area actually on the other side of it too. So now it's a waiting game to see if the sturgeon like the look of their new nursery. Scientists still don't know how many mature females are coming up the James, how often or even what time of year. The females frequent the river less often than the males. Males spawn every year to every other year likely. Females every three to five years. A good sized female that weighs 300 pounds may have 40 pounds of eggs in her. It's really stressful. You're going from salt water to fresh water. You've got all this extra weight in you now. You're fighting currents. You're swimming all the way upstream. You're not going to hang around. You're going to find your spawning area. Hopefully you wait for some uh, partners to get with you. You release your eggs. You can't do anything else for the season you leave and you start to build up again. When they created the reef, the team also laid down some heavy duty mats that they can lift and monitor. Yeah, unfortunately it's as egg free as it can be. Well, so what we're hoping to have is little black, or black specks, or well, little, little black balls on it. That would be sturgeon eggs, so. So no sturgeon eggs yet, but Matt's not surprised. His observations and radio monitoring suggest that in this river at least, the sturgeon are spawning in the autumn. I believe that they're spawning in the fall. We're monitoring the reef for spring and fall, and then when we pull the egg mats out, we'll be able to find an egg, actually see an egg, and that's your 100% you know that the spawning reef is working. Because that would be very, very cool if we could show that there is a spring and a fall spawn, that opens up a whole line of genetic work. So with luck and environmental care, the sturgeon should be saved from two of the pitfalls of population genetics, bottlenecks and founder effects, maybe. Because with its long lifespan, 
we won't know if it's successful for a generation or more.